MidDirect Talk is a series of seminars organized by MidDirect, featuring several financial experts and asset managers sharing their views on markets and investment opportunities. For this edition, we have partnered up with FundSmith Equity Fund. Terry Smith will be once again giving us an update on the performance of the fund, together with his views on the financial world and current trends. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there's our disclaimer, which you know we're required to show you and which you should read. So you've probably seen it before. Uh, performance, obviously not our uh, uh, best year by a considerable margin. In fact, our worst year. With long stead, uh, I hope you recall that uh, we thought that at some point we would both underperform and or lose money. And indeed, that all came to pass. It doesn't make it feel any better. So it doesn't feel any better to us, probably not to you or your clients either. Um, but it is inevitable. There is no, providing you're not um, changing your investment style continually, there isn't any uh, investment strategy or style which consistently outperforms in all market conditions and all reporting periods. Um, I would commit, if any of you think there are, I commend to you a very good, uh, in my opinion, four part docudrama on Netflix about Bernie Madoff. You certainly got consistent performance from Bernie until you got some uh, rather bad performance, like you lost a lot. That's the only thing that ever performs consistently uh, at all times. What worked and what didn't, our attribution, and the largest contributors on the left, mostly pretty simple. If you, if you read my letter, you see if I, I say in there, if you ask me to choose one word to define those uh, companies, I would say defensive. We've got a drugs company and two consumer goods companies amongst the five. It's pretty obvious what worked last year. Um, and we no doubt will get into questions uh, later. Uh, and uh, we can look at things. I mean, the consumer goods companies have been sufficiently defensive that they are now, in general terms, much more highly rated than the tech companies. If you look at the detractors, I guess the word that springs to mind there is tech. Uh, I'll say a bit more about tech exposure later on, because uh, I'm not totally happy with that as a, as a blanket explanation for things, or that we are particularly large in tech now, notwithstanding the fact we've got more tech names in the portfolio. I would only say um, the following about the identification of, of problems in there. One is, I think there are real fundamental issues to address in Meta, you know, Facebook and PayPal. Uh, in the case of PayPal, we had sought consistently to address those by engagement and uh, we've actually given up now and sold them. Uh, so that's that. Um, and um, once we've got outside that, I would say, I don't think there are any fundamental issues that I'm aware of in Microsoft and IDEX, certainly, probably not in Amazon either, uh, particularly. So we really are talking about derating at work in, the, in three of the five companies, I would say. The particular stock problems of Meta and PayPal aside, I mean, interestingly, if we hadn't owned those two things, we'd probably uh, track the market approximately last year. Um, as you know, we always run through this. It's our strategy, simple three-step strategy. I think it's important that we do. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but it's just a question of, are we sticking to what we said we're going to do or is there style drift going on? So only invest in good companies, the first point. Uh, second point is don't overpay, third is do nothing. Let's start with only invest in good companies. Um, this is our look through table, which we publish every year. We take the companies in our portfolio, we work out a number of um, measures and ratios for them, and we show them these metrics to you, uh, weighted for the holdings in our portfolio, so you can gauge from these metrics, whether you think we've got good companies or not. Um, last year, the return on capital employed at our in our portfolio is 32%, which might be an all-time record, I think. So quite clearly, it uh, improved significantly from the, the trough, which it reached of 25% during the pandemic. And it's running, getting on for two times the level of the, uh, of the index. If you look over to the right, where we've got the S&P uh, and the FTSE 100. In our view, the single most important measure of whether or not we really want to own a business is what kind of return on capital it can deliver. Uh, gross margins were rock steady at 64%. Our companies are making things for uh, for 36 and selling them for 100. Um, as you look over to the indices, you'll see they're pretty rock steady as well in the sort of low 40s. They're making things for 60 and selling them for 100. It's clearly better to make things for 40 something and sell for 100 or 36 and sell for 100, but it is to make things for 60 and sell for 100. Um, and this is the biggest single fundamental defense there is against uh, uh, inflation, basically, which is to say it uh, it tells you what the, uh, the input cost inflation will do to your margins and also gives you a clue of how much you may have to adjust prices to try and keep up with inflation. Um, operating profit margins, taking out the remainder of uh, operating expenses, selling general and administrative expenses, you'll see. Uh, rose to 28% last year, which again is uh, is sort of a record high for the companies. Um, 
and significantly higher than either the S&P or the FTSE 100. Cash conversion is a bit peculiar. It's dropped to 88% and is about the same as the S&P, although still well ahead of the FTSE. We like cash measures. We like measuring cash conversion. We like measuring uh, free cash flow generation. We like measuring free cash flow yield. We like cash because it's a very acid test, but it's also a very volatile measure. And you need to probably take multi years sometimes into account. Uh, the whole point about accrual accounting, where we look at profits rather than cash, is that the accrual accounting methodology is to spread cash flows, uh, 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 ins and outflows across a number of reporting periods for some items. And so what you're seeing at work here are some peculiar factors around the events of the pandemic and, and the unwinding of the pandemic. During the pandemic, quite a number of companies that we invest in had stock outs. They basically sold the whole of their stock. They couldn't make enough to keep up with demand in a number of cases. In some cases, they had problems with inputs. Uh, they were selling out stock pretty rapidly, uh, but they couldn't get replacement componentry, particularly in things like semiconductors, although there were plenty of more mundane things like bleach where capacity just wasn't sufficient. Um, the net result of that is when they had the opportunity to, uh, to stock up on the components like semiconductors uh, as they became available, they basically binged on those. They've gone from just in time methodology of keeping uh, things like components to just in case. They don't want to be caught out again by running out of components and, and items like that. So it's depressed cash conversion. I think we really probably need to take a multi-year view here in order to get a clear picture. So I think it will be at least another 12 months where, before we can sit back and, and say, yeah, we're back to about 100% conversion. But I think we'll get there. Interest cover was 20 times on our companies last year. So their interests and rents were covered 20 times by their operating profits. Uh, that's about twice the index. So their good operating performances are not being generated by um, lots of financial engineering. These are very conservatively financed companies. And looking at that financial metric picture, I would say to you, it's pretty clear, notwithstanding a couple of individual uh, stock problems, which I've been quite open about uh, in, in relation to the portfolio, there's always a problem of some sort. And in market conditions like this, I think they're going to be exposed. Taken as a group, I think we own companies which are very good companies and which are very significantly better than the index. Don't overpay. Um, historically, the most vexed part of the strategy is a lot less vexed now because what happened last year was simply a derating of a, a portion of our portfolio, particularly in the, the technology area and some other highly rated areas like IDEX. The net result is free cash flow yield. So the free cash flows the company generate divided by their market price uh, basically went to 3.2% last year, rose to that. And so they became cheaper, but the yield rose, the prices fell. Um, and that basically, without getting into spurious accuracy, is about the same as the S&P 500 at the year end. Uh, clearly, it's a, it's a spot measure on the two things. So I wouldn't get into uh, too much differentiation around that level. It's clearly a lot cheaper than the, the FTSE 100. And if you believe in the uh, the quality of those companies or the, the value proposition that they represent, good. I don't actually think the portfolio they've got is terribly comparable. So. Basically, we're sitting on a portfolio of companies which are or have been very significantly better than the index in terms of their performance metrics and which are rated about the same. Doesn't mean they won't become cheaper. I've got no crystal ball, but it's a reasonably comfortable position. Free cash flow growth last year was only 1%, which is the lowest I think we've ever recorded on the portfolio. Again, we're looking at some very peculiar ebbs and flows of, of cash flow uh, surrounding the uh, the pandemic. So people who, uh, who, as I say, have, have basically loaded up a lot of stock because they had stock outs during the pandemic are obviously going to have adverse free cash flow moves. That combined with uh, you know, a few uh, problems in terms of uh, weaker demand have depressed the free cash flow. Just to elaborate on a, a remark I made in the annual letter, which an awful lot of um, commentators picked up on, I said, if you're frightened by a 1% free cash flow growth, you probably don't want to read next year's letter. And um, I'm not trying to tell you the future there and predict a bad future. Uh, in fact, just for clarification, our models at the moment for what they're worth uh, suggest that our free cash flow growth in 2023 on our portfolio will be about 11%. Uh, which doesn't surprise me. I think that the, uh, you know, the the modeling of free cash flows, if you get a year where you get abnormally low from a fairly consistent set of businesses, will probably get higher than the long run average in 2023. The reason for my remark is, and I think this is blindingly obvious, we are in a period of high uncertainty about macro factors. So that's all I was saying. Not that I've got some crystal ball and I think we're going to be worse than 1% growth in 2023. We might be, but it's not what at the moment we can see. Do nothing. 
Uh, the third leg of our strategy, if you look at the number of changes we made in stocks last year, you will almost certainly think that we've uh, broken away from that. Not so. Um, I'll come on to the next slide in a moment, which shows the total portfolio turnover. And it doesn't equate to much. It was 7.4%, which is still very low. The latest statistics I've seen on the average uh, OIC uh, portfolio turnover last year was 60%, 6 zero. Um, we're clearly way, way, way below that and in line with our sort of long term averages. But there were quite a few names. You might think, well, how do quite a few names, you know, five sales or four purchases get you to 7.4% turnover? This is very typical of us. By the time we come to sell things, we haven't been adding to them and they've quite often descended to a small part of the portfolio that performed very well. Um, and quite often when we buy things, we don't go all in uh, in buying them. We feel our way into a position, particularly if we've got a degree of uncertainty about some negatives which we know about, which we're waiting for the market to discount. Um, let's just take you through the individual um, holdings. Johnson & Johnson, we purchased originally because we like the uh, medical equipment and devices and over-the-counter medicine and healthcare businesses, both of which have not performed very well, ironically, during the period of our holding. The thing that's been much more uh, of a, a good performer has been the drugs portfolio, which is not our favourite part of the business. And we got to the point where um, the medical devices and, and over-the-counter medicines business still weren't performing very well, and they're spinning out the OTC business. And the drugs business is now facing quite a reasonable um, uphill climb to uh, adjust to drugs which are coming off uh, patent. Uh, the current one is Stellara, the uh, Crohn's disease uh, drug which is coming off. So we, we decided to sell that. Starbucks, um, you know, we like um, the QSR uh, businesses. We particularly like ones which have got a significant franchise element, which they have. Um, we just think the management have completely lost the plot in this one. I mean, Howard Schultz is back for his third spell as CEO, which is pretty bad. Um, the new CEO incoming is the former CEO of Reckitt Bengis, so who is one of the people who was involved in our decision to sell our Reckitt Bengis. So we're not very good about that. And one of the, the points about Starbucks in terms of the way they ran the business was their uh, relationship with their staff, their partners, as they call them, which had always been part of the proposition that they were trying to sell uh, to us, the consumer. That has uh, become a hell of a struggle with them with a, I think, very mishandled unionization drive uh, in the United States in particular. Uh, Pone we sold, uh, Elevator and Escalator Company. Uh, their biggest market is China. There's an obvious problem there. And, and we switched that holding into Otis on the buy side. You'll see there, Otis is the largest elevator and escalator company in the world, American based, a much even more even geographic spread of business. And it's also spun out from United Technologies recently or relatively recently. And we think it's got some mileage in terms of improving how the business can operate now that it's no longer regarded as a cash cow division of a, of a conglomerate. We sold Intuit. I'll come on and talk later a bit about share based compensation, which I wrote about in my annual letter. Um, Intuit, we were aware did share based compensation it come as a surprise to us. And we were aware that the analysts had swallowed this hook, line and sinker and were therefore taking their non-GAAP earnings adjusted for this uh, favourably, of course, into account, which we thought was a bit problematic. The real thing that made us sell it was not that they use share based compensation or that they have adjusted GAAP earnings, based on non-GAAP earnings, but using it, is that the management have actually begun to believe this stuff, uh, we think, because they went and bought MailChimp uh, last, towards the end of last year, and MailChimp was and something which we think they dramatically overpaid for and which we don't think very well within their core business. And I think they did it because they've begun to believe that they can assess uh, the um, value proposition of acquisitions based upon accretion or dilution of earnings, which I think is a really bad place to start, and based upon earnings from these non-GAAP adjusted earnings. So uh, it was time to say goodbye, which is a bit of a shame because I think the core uh, accounting and tax business there is a good one. Uh, PayPal. Uh, we'd opened PayPal since it was spun out from eBay. Um, my watch phrase for this in my letter was a company that seems intent on snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. They started with the pole position in terms of online payments outside China and had piled that into a lamentable share price performance uh, driven by a few things. They acquired a lot of new clients over the pandemic. They've made no effective uh, inroads into engaging more of those clients because you can't just grow by acquiring new clients. At some point, you have to get the clients to transact with you more. They haven't done that. Um, their cost control has been poor. They've made acquisitions that were value destructive uh, and their advertising and marketing, in my view, is lamentable too. Um, we try to engage with the company because when we think we've got a business with a good core position that's doing some things which we think are not right, 
our first instinct as a, as a long term holder is to try to work with them so that we can get changes which will get the, uh, the, the core business back on track. We failed. Uh, as much as we tried with these people, we were basically given the brush off and it was time to sell. What did we buy? I've obviously covered Otis. We bought Adobe, the leader in um, uh, gra graphics and creative uh, uh, material software. Um, looked like a, a great position in terms of the, the, uh, the company's returns and its valuation having been somewhat uh, de depreciated by the market movements, which is what we started buying. And we thought there's a very long runway ahead for this company in terms of the development of graphics that we use for all kinds of things, which are uh, basically analog at the moment. Um, the fly in the ointment is their proposed acquisition of Figma, a company which has software which allows collaborative work on this kind of material. Um, that raises a few questions. It raises the question of price. It's a high price. It raises the question of whether their competitive position is as good as we thought it was, and it raises the obvious question of um, competition authorities' views of these things. We're still engaged with the company uh, literally this week in terms of talking about that to see where we come down on the, on the thing. If it weren't for that, I think we would have a fine holding, but at the moment we are puzzled about what we feel about that. We bought Metal of Toledo. You might be less familiar with this one. It's the world leader in weighing equipment. Uh, also makes some other equipment as well, uses it in laboratories and other applications, things like pipetting equipment. Um, you know, an awful lot of things uh, require weighing. If you think about drugs and food processing and testing, uh, accurate weighing, and I don't, I don't just mean you know, the, the sort of thing that we use on our food packaging, uh, but things that, that get down to uh, a millionth of a gram are things that these people have to start uh, dealing with when they're making uh, things like drug formulations. These are, are the leaders and it. it's a very, very well run business in our view, uh, which you can almost set your watch by. Um, I've, I've got a story about a visit to one of their factories, which I'll tell you if we have time later. And we started buying Apple. We had a tiny holding in Apple at the year end, um, under 100 billion pounds. We have added to it a little. We're waiting for events like today to add to it. We eventually became convinced that my misgivings about Apple were not right, that we think that the, the service part of the business, which is growing twice the rate of, a, of the hardware bit, and which has got 70% gross margins, is real, that it's not just mumbo jumbo about an ecosystem, uh, and that things that are in there like music, like TV, like Apple Pay, are uh, real additions to this business, and it had been somewhat derated by the market. And we gradually, we were trying to gradually feel our way into buying it, because there's some fairly obvious negatives surrounding the business at the moment. Obviously, the chip shortage, uh, the China uh, supply chain disruption as well. And we basically are trying to take um, advantage of that to feel our way into buying the state. What does that all boil down to in terms of numbers? I already told you one. If you look at portfolio turnover rate, three lines up from the bottom, you'll see 7.4%, which is certainly not our lowest annual turnover, being our highest either. So, you know, there's a lot of names in there, but a lot less activity. Um, actual uh, dealing costs, you'll see 0 0.003. Uh, of a percent uh, there, so less than one, but it's a significantly less than one basis point. £777,412 on a £22 billion pound fund is peanuts in terms of dealing. You can get a better scale for the activity we did uh, rather than looking at the names, which I know is what people already like, always like on by taking that number on what we spend and looking and comparing it with the numbers to the left. Uh, you can see, you know, in a year when we had 4.1% turnover, we spent nearly six million pounds. We weren't actually doing an awful lot of shifting in positions uh, during this period. A few topics I touched upon in the annual letter, just to uh, say, you know, what happened last year was the end of easy money. It's the end of uh, low or negative interest rates, certainly negative real interest rates, and of uh, a massive uh, uh, um, printing of money in terms of use of quantitative easing for central banks to buy government debt. It's over. Uh, and that has basically unwound the valuation of a lot of things, including some of the things that we own. Um, and it's got us back to about a market rating. Um, and, you know, one of the things, again, that commentators say is Terry Smith blames central banks for, for, for the performance. No, I don't blame anybody, blame me, basically, for this. But, you know, as I said to you, we've always been clear that we don't attempt to market time. One of the questions I've been asked is, couldn't you foresee this coming? Yeah, but I could have foreseen it back to, you know, 2013, 14, when the Fed tried to taper. Um, you know, it's uh, it's quite dangerous to try and predict bear markets. Um, uh, you know, some people who've got very good star rotation products will say to me that, you know, the sort of macro indicators of bear markets 
will predict 10 of the next three bear markets. So we don't try and take moves in advance of that, but I'm just offering it by way of that's what I think happened. It's pretty obvious that what's happened, but I like to write it in the letter so investors can read it. Please. Uh, technology. Another thing you'll read is that we've had a tech splurge. There's one of the headlines. Terry Smith's tech buying spree continues with Apple purchase. Uh, Interactive investor in November. Um, uh, we ended the year with 20.7% of, uh, of our portfolio in, in the MSCI uh, technology sector. Uh, it was 23.2% at the end of 2014. So I can't quite see a splurge. Uh, one. Secondly, if you look at the way we've been buying into some of the things, Apple, uh, Amazon, Alphabet, Adobe and Meta, in combination, they amounted to 9% of the portfolio at year end. Novo Nordisk, our largest holding, was 7.2%. So the whole lot of them are already a little bit bigger than our drug company, which is our leading one, because uh, precisely of the kind of events that we're buying into. I think I can see within all of these businesses a, a core, very good business. But I can also see problems hanging over them, regulatory problems, uh, overspend uh, for the uh, conditions of the uh, pandemic to gear up in terms of fulfillment. Uh, as I say, China supply chain, um, the Figma acquisition, metaverse and, and regulatory issues in meta. So just at the moment, we're not buying an awful lot more of these. We are buying some now and they are scaling up. The other thing about holdings is when we look at holdings, our second biggest holding at the moment is uh, is Microsoft, which obviously is a tech company. Microsoft didn't become our second biggest holding or our biggest holding, which has been from time to time, primarily through us adding to it. It got there by performance. Uh, and that's quite often the way I like these things to uh, to uh, unwind. Uh, I, finally, on tech, I mean, I'm not even particularly keen on the, on the terminology that we use here. Uh, whichever one of these companies, yeah, they're, they are tarred by the brush of market movement from time to time and by commentators and so on, but they're quite different companies. You know, if you look at these companies here, we've got an online search and advertising business, a, a cloud and e-commerce business, uh, a consumer mobile electronics uh, business, um, a graphics software business, and a social media and uh, and communications business, which makes all its revenues from advertising. It, they're quite separate business. And we haven't even got on to some of the other technology companies that we've got in the portfolio, like Amadeus, which is an airline and hotel reser reservations business, or ADP, which just reported today, which is a payroll processing business. Yeah, they are all technology businesses, but they've quite, got quite different fundamental drivers. Engagement, um, look, we uh, we talk a lot about ESG, part of the, the, this is the G, the governance. We get asked about our engagement from time to time. I don't write in the annual letter for the sake of trying to produce controversy, believe it or not. I write about it because I think it's important for you to know what we actually do uh, day to day on this front. Uh, we've had engagement in the last few years with Unilever um, and it's not been good, uh, frankly. Um, and uh, we think that there are some unanswered questions at Unilever, which really the uh, the board uh, and the management, although the management is obviously changing now, should address uh, things like the uh, acquisition, which we highlight in the letter of the uh, well, of all of the acquisitions for the uh, the beauty and wellbeing division, but the one in particular that, that we highlight in there, which is the Korean cosmetics company, which they basically paid 2.3 billion euros for. This is a company which was the Biggest PE transaction had ever been done in Korea at the time when it was done. They bought it from Bain Capital and Goldman Sachs, you know, red alert, and they paid six times what Bain Capital and Goldman Sachs paid for it one year earlier. I think we should probably be told how it's performed, and I, I kind of know the answer to that. When we've got that answer, how what was the decision making process in buying it? and how we might avert such a, a waste of our money in the future. So I think there are important questions to be answered here. Obviously, we've got an activist involved in the form of Nelson Peltz now, uh, and we hope that he will have a positive impact on the business. But uh, other than the exit of the chief executive prematurely, uh, we don't know what um, is proposed at the moment. We, uh, we're still sitting there waiting and see. As I said, with PayPal, we try to engage um, with all, all companies. We engage privately first. We don't make we're not, we don't go out there and try and make uh, an awful lot of noise. Our first thing is to engage in regular meetings. If that doesn't work, we ask for regular meetings with the independent directors, the chairman and so on to try and get our point across. If it doesn't work in the end, we're just going to sell. And that's what we did with PayPal. I noticed that um, in the write-ups about my annual letter, not one single journalist wrote about share-based compensation. 
I I'll leave you to make your own conclusions on what that means about uh, financial journalism. Um, but um, I just wanted to touch upon this because I think it is an important issue. Um, and I think it's one we may well see a lot more of, particularly given what's happening in the, in the tech sector now. Um, it's become an increasingly important part of companies, tech companies' expenses in recent times. Uh, of the 75 companies in the S&P Dow Jones technology sector, uh, basically, if you look at the amount of share-based compensation expense that they've, they've been, that they've had in paying people with shares, not cash, it's gone from 2.2% of revenues a decade ago to 4.1% at the end of 2021. It doesn't sound like a lot, does it? But try and bear in mind that on average, their revenues quintupled during this period. So the absolute numbers here are pretty darn big. Amongst those 75 companies, 45 of them have removed share-based compensation from a non-GAAP version of earnings that they provide to us, their operating earnings and their uh, earnings per share. Uh, when I say removed, what that means is at the moment, uh, the share-based compensation under GAAP is, unsurprisingly, a deduction from your uh, your, your uh, uh, profits, uh, before uh, from your revenues before you report your profits, because it's an expense. What they do is they take that out, they add it back, so it doesn't exist as an expense. That's kind of, I mean, I could almost stop there in terms of what my objections are, but I won't stop there, I'll go on a bit. It, just to give you a number on that, in 2021, that was $26 billion of expenses that were excluded from the profit and loss accounts of these 45 companies. So it's about um, $600 million per company, or, or as we call it, a lot, basically. Um, I think that's probably something they shouldn't be doing, fairly obviously, that's why I've, I've, uh, build, uh, I've uh, basically um, flagged this. What do they say about it? They say, ah, oh, well, we take it out because it's a non-cash expense, stop. There are plenty of items in the P&L account that are non-cash, depreciation and amortization non-cash right um deferred revenues it's a non-cash item right um but you know taking it out and saying well we take it is just not right if you want to measure a company's cash flows you should be looking in the cash flow statement not in a doctored PL statement where you take out a number that you'd really like to see removed for share based compensation and they say the calculation of the expense requires valuation methodologies because you've got to value the, the shares that you're giving out in share based compensation um, and these are difficult because they require estimates and outside the company's control. There are plenty of things in the PL account which require estimates, which are difficult to estimate, and which are outside company's control. This is by no means new. They say it involves double counting because you have the expense and the number of shares has increased, and so it affects the EPS. No, I'm afraid there are plenty of items which are in the profit and loss account and the balance sheet and uh, gravitate between the two over time or have a circular effect between the two. And also, this is only something that affects earnings per share. It doesn't affect actual operating profit numbers. And they say everybody does it. Well, does everybody do it? Take... No, they don't, actually. Um, here's Microsoft versus Intuit. And you see there's Microsoft, which doesn't make any adjustment for share based compensation, even though it uses it. And by the way, I've got no problem with paying people in shares. It can obviously be beneficial in terms of aligning interest. Microsoft, when we did this calculation uh, at the end of the year, was on gap earnings multiple of 25 times. Hmm. Intuit, which makes this adjustment and reports non-GAAP earnings, was on 28 times earnings. Not bad, pretty comparable with Microsoft, I would say. Um, and the analysts have swallowed hook, line and sinker, these non-GAAP earnings, because that's what it shows you on Bloomberg. If you make the adjustment to put the uh, share-based compensation debit back into the profit and loss account and show GAAP earnings, it's on 44 times. Mm, are we really happy with Intuit on 75% higher earnings multiple than Microsoft? Not entirely. Um, and then, as I say, the part, you might say, well, Terry, that kind of come as a great shock. I mean, it didn't come as a great shock. What did come as a shock is that the management actually believe that that's something you should start basing things like $12 billion acquisitions on. Um, that was uh, enough to send us over the edge, I'm afraid. Ironically, um, uh, the uh, share-based compensation uh, measures are one of these very rare things. I can't think of another one which distort not only the profit and loss account, but even the cash flow, which is what we normally rely upon. So if you look at um, our friends over at Microsoft, you'll see that they are rated on, uh, on free cash flow yield at about 3.5% on their GAAP earnings uh, and GAAP uh, cash flow. If you take the cash flow, the um, share-based compensation in the cash flow is an operating item, but it's clearly not an operating item because it's distorting the operating cash flows of the company. If we take it out, Microsoft goes to a 3.1% free cash flow. It's a little bit more expensive. But if you do it in Intuit, 
it takes them to from a 3.5% comparable free cash flow today. It's the same as Microsoft, good business. It takes you to a much, much more expensive business, 2.2%. Um, and I think that's it, Conrad. I think we've um, uh, through the site. Yeah, there we are. Quick and there we go. Thank you very much. I'll um, hand back to Conrad and you and um, have some of my tea, if I may. Great. No, well, thank you for that, Terry. So, and um, thanks everyone for the questions. There's quite a few here, so we'll uh, endeavour to get through those. Um, okay, first question. Warning, Terry. Right arm fast from the nursery end. Um, roughly 18 months ago, PayPal was your biggest holding, but now it appears you must have started to question fundamentals at around that time. Meanwhile, wouldn't prudent fund management have led you to trim your position, especially as it looks as though it were richly valued? Does your do mantra, sorry, does your do nothing mantra need a challenge? Um, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll elaborate. Um, uh, as my colleagues will attest, I think if you um, if you speak to them, this was one where my I was uh, very, very, very close, not just to trimming it, but to selling the whole position at that point, And I hesitated and um, I was wrong. Uh, so it wasn't the mantra, I think, that was wrong. Because I was I was on the verge of acting against the mantra, and I was um, persuaded not to, if you like. And I, I, I partly by myself. I mean, I'm not blaming somebody else for this, and I shouldn't. I'm not. Um, I think that part of it that one was, was must query, and that's partly why I wrote this up in the letter this year for people, is I think that the problem is our view that if we've got a good business, and we definitely had a good business in PayPal, I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that this was a good business, business with sort of 30% returns on capital and growing well, well into double digits. Um, there was absolutely no doubt that we had that on our hands. When things start to go wrong, and they did start to go wrong, as I say, with lack of engagement with the invest, with the new clients, with cost control, with the acquisitions, I think we should be much less forgiving with the engagement basically, uh, because you know our experience now, having tried it a couple of times, is that most of these companies are not susceptible to reason when it comes to this kind of thing, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, for some reason, and maybe you can explain the psychologist, psychology of this better than I can, um, it, it, it's, it appears that it's rather naive to think that you can pitch up and say, hello, we're Fundsmith, we're a long-term investor, we've got a billion pounds of your stock, um, and we've held it since the inception of your company as an independent company, and we'd like to talk to you about this so that they'll take any notice. They took absolutely no notice whatsoever, whereas Elliott Management bought a stake, and I think you know, there, there is no possibility that they held the stake for more than one month, and they had a seat on the board and an information sharing agreement, right? Uh, it's quite clear that there are, their, their reaction is to that and not to long, you know, they mouth all these things about wanting long term shareholders, and frankly, they treat us with disdain. And that's what I think that's the thing that I learn out of it. Uh, not not so much that the, you know, um, trying to be patient uh, uh, about this and do nothing is the thing that needs it. Um, and the other thing is, it, you know, blame me for that. Okay, thank you. Do you rue selling Nestle and keeping hold of Unilever? Yes. Now, now these <laughs> questions are really good. I could, I could go on about these all day long, could I? Yes. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I, look, I think Nestle has uh, managed under new management to turn a corner in terms of um, uh, its approach to uh, uh, the product uh, and what it's selling. And I think as a result, um, it's a much better business, uh, simply. Yeah. I mean, clearly, it's not in the same areas. If you, if you said, looking at fast mover consumer goods, as a whole, very general, big general generalization. Do you think food and beverage is tougher, or do you think uh, you know household cleaning products and personal care is tougher? And clearly, Unilever spans both, with more increasingly more in the household cleaning products and personal care area. The personal care area is a much easier business in many respects to make money from than the uh, uh, than the food and beverage business, but not if you get a good pair of hands on like we have at Nestle and, uh, and a relatively poor pair of hands on like we've had at uh, Unilever. Yes, I do. Yeah. OK, we've had quite a few questions on Meta, maybe unsurprisingly. Would yeah. you maybe uh, elaborate on your rationale for continuing to hold it? Yeah, I mean, pretty simply, we've got a business. I mean, uh, uh, let me talk about core business, um, regulatory concerns and the, the so-called Metaverse. Uh, the core business is um, got some challenges, but it's still a pretty good core business. Um, it's got 1.8 billion daily users 
and about 12 million individual businesses providing uh, advertising revenue. And notwithstanding some challenges there, which are quite significant, the new Apple operating system and the EU's approach to targeted advertising, we probably, if we weren't looking at the metaverse spend, would be sitting there with a business which is going to incur some cyclicality in terms of its revenues and some fundamental changes uh, in terms of operating systems and uh, regulatory, but it's, it's sitting on a single figure PE, right? And that's pretty attractive, uh, actually. Um, the thing that I'm not that so yeah, I'd like that, and I would still be in it uh, if, if that were the sole. Oh, I'm still in it. If that were the sole thing, and that's kind of one of the things that keeps me rooted in it. I'm not that concerned about certain aspects of the regulatory challenge. I'm a bit concerned about the EU approach to targeted advertising. I mean, the whole idea that we can't have targeted advertising strikes me as bizarre. Uh, really, I mean, so we think it's better if we have non-targeted advertising. I'm, I'm a bit puzzled by that, um, but you know, strange things do happen. I'm trying not to get too uh, excited about it because I think it's so illogical that it probably won't happen. But you never know with the, some of these things. I'm not in the least bit concerned by the um, competition uh, antitrust uh, approach because I think probably broken into its component parts and without the current management managing all those parts, this would probably be a more valuable business, you know, because we've got the original Facebook business, uh, we've got the Instagram business, uh, and we've got the WhatsApp business. In their individual parts, I think that some of the parts are probably worth a lot more. The story I always tell, and I'll very many examples of very big uh, companies broken up in, in America by antitrust action, but the two which um, uh, are often flagged are Standard Oil and at and In both cases, the broke up creative value. It's uh, really quite interesting. There's a great story about John D. Rockefeller being on a golf course uh, when he got the news of the breakup of Standard Oil uh, and saying to his golf partner, who was a Catholic priest, by the way, buy Standard Oil, father. And, and he was absolutely right. So that bit doesn't worry me. The metaverse, it, it, the problem is, obviously, we're spending on something here which is a bit of an unknown. Um, but it's not as much of an unknown as people think. You would have thought to read the commentary on it that it's something where we have no idea what it means. And these are the only people spending money on it. So it's a complete punch, rather like one of Alphabet's uh, projects to do things which never, ever produce anything. I, our measure of this is to talk to people, other people who are in the technology area, people like Apple and Microsoft, and to talk to people who are potential users of this, as, as this people like L'Oreal, and so on and say, what does it mean? What do you think will happen? And you get quite a lot of um, positive feedback from them on the fact that something will emerge from this, which will involve us probably having meetings like this where we do actually get to feel that we're in the same room. And more importantly, from the point of view of our investments, buying your cosmetics like you're in the specialist cosmetics retail shop with your friend and getting opinions on how things go. So I, I think that there's a high likelihood that something which we don't fully understand will develop here. And there's a possibility, given their initial base of users and so on, that this meta, that meta will be a, a very significant player in it. But it's still a, a bit more of an unknown than I really like uh, out there. I think one of the big um, sort of events that we await to see what's going to happen here while we sit with our single figure PE uh, uh, digital advertising business and hug that to us for comfort uh, is sooner or later, probably in the course of this year, we're going to see Apple uh, launch its glasses for this. And I think that's probably quite a good moment to judge how this is going to develop, uh, basically. Um, and uh, that's that's about where we are. Right? And when we bought the stock, uh, Julian, who's rather good at these things, said to us, it will be a difficult stock to own. Um, and then he came back a late, bit later and said, maybe it's a too difficult stock to own. Um, um, yeah, maybe it is. Thank you. Um, you recently added the Japanese company Kients to your investable universe. Should we yep. expect more Asian companies to follow? Uh, look, we, um, we've added Kients. Um, we're obviously very interested in companies like Taiwan Semiconductor. Uh, yes, I think you should. Yeah, I mean, look, we continue to explore um, and it would be kind of unusual if we didn't have more Asian companies over time into our uh, investable universe and, um, and and sooner or later some into our uh, into our actual portfolio. I mean, the thing that we've shied away, not just in this, but in feet, which we obviously closed, uh, is 
wholesale sort of uh, Chinese uh, company ownership. I mean, the events of the last year there uh, would seem to me to be an illustrative uh, uh, example of, of what the risks of ownership are there. And I don't think they're the risks of ownership that you would expect us to bear uh, in this portfolio. I mean, we've just finished talking about Meta, or at least for now, unless someone wants to come back to it. One of the things that I didn't touch upon there that you could legitimately ask about is, Terry, isn't one of the problems there that it's not the case that you are worried about this and worry about that, and you could go, at, we've got no say in this. We don't even vote, right? We knew that when we went in. I didn't suddenly discover that after we bought it. We don't. We know that. Uh, and when you own Chinese businesses, most particularly Chinese businesses in some of the areas that we're interested in, you don't own them. There's absolutely no chance that you've got real ownership there. So that's what, one of the obstacles to that ownership, to that, that is that this particular nexus of, of companies in the area, I mean, after all, what's the world's biggest, biggest, second biggest economy, has some very scary ownership characteristics. Thank you. Uh, Novo Nordisk was a great success for you in 2022. I suppose I could great, stop there. Great, 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 yeah. great question. We'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> does, uh, does the price now reflect overly optimistic projections of Wigovi sales in the coming years? I don't think so. Um, I mean, um, you know, when we look at, uh, no, I'm just calling it up now so I can give you uh, an actual, it's rather interesting uh, to uh, to look at it because, of course, we have got Eli Lilly uh, sitting alongside it with Mongero to uh, to think about. So we can uh, we can say we can do a bit of look across, although obviously that's a bit more. I mean, our, um, our Novo Nordisk is not lowly rated. It's on, we reckon, on a 2.6% uh, free cash flow yield. I mean, you could say, well, that's just bloody more. PepsiCo is on 2.7, right? I mean, I, I, I said at the outset that um, our um, uh, consumer staples have uh, got to the point where, you know, it's kind of like, mm, okay, um, Coloplast, another Danish company, but one that makes catheters and tubes, and so on, is on 2.2%. You know, I'm trying to give you some, because valuations in the end are always about things which sit alongside you. And if you say, well, PepsiCo, which is actually the nearest I've got on my sheet at the moment, David Campari is on 2.6, right? I think this thing is going to grow uh, fast enough to justify that and certainly fast enough to justify it relative to that. Goldman Sachs, fun enough today, have just um, uh, produced a thing on, um, I think it's on Mongero rather than, uh, I was reading it when we came online, so I'm afraid I've, I've stopped in the middle, so I can't be absolutely confident about it. But they were talking about Mongero, and I think they've got the sales down uh, at the moment for this year. It's either the Mongero or it's the combined drugs. Give me a second, I'll call it out. I don't want to make a mistake in, in telling you this. So just bear with me a second while I look at my uh, look at my incoming today to see what it's telling me. Um, ding, 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 ding. Um, yeah, Mongero, $2.7 billion this year, okay? Um, their estimate for 2030, I think it's 2030, so the end of the decade is $27 billion, right? It's like, wow, uh, this is uh, I mean, one of the main questions over the approval of the drug, uh, which doesn't form part of the formal FDA um, process of, uh, of trials and drug approval, is that this will become a lifestyle judge drug. Yeah, it, it, we need to begin to debate it, right? Um, there are plenty of people who hopefully will benefit from the clinical uh, effects of, uh, of taking Wegovy or Hot Montero. Um, and, and that's good. Um, but, you know, one of the things, if you read, you know, we read an awful lot of stuff, is there's a, uh, a thing called, um, uh, um, uh, not Wagavi, a uh, Zempic face, because of course, because there's been production difficulties in making enough of this stuff to satisfy the demand, um, there's an awful lot of off-label supply. You can go and see doctors and talk about your, uh, your, your weight problem, uh, and, uh, and they'll take some uh, a Zempic, which is uh, some aglutide uh, being prescribed for diabetes, uh, and cross out that and put Wagovi and, and hand it over to you. It's the same drug. It's exactly the same drug. The, the, the genesis of this was in clinical data from the development of a semaglutide for diabetes. Um, and um, so the, the term that's used is Ozempic for it, but some journal, I think it's the New York Times, maybe or the Wall Street Journal, said there's a thing called Ozempic face, where people get slight sag in their face from taking this and getting weight loss. Well, you don't get it if you're quite weighty to begin with. You don't get ozempic face from doing that. Where you get it is if you're, you know, uh, somebody who lives in the uh, the ritzier parts of LA and the Upper East Side of New York, and you don't really lose, need to lose weight in the first place. You know, you're talking about people who are on the, the skinny side of the uh, of the BMI index, 
who are obsessed and take this stuff. It's a lifestyle trap. Right? People will, and so I think no, at the moment, that's not the case. I would also say with regard to um, uh, no matter who risk, we much admire their approach to drug development. It's the only company who's, whose approach we, uh, we admire like that. And I don't think this is a one trick pony. I think they have, they, they are about making big groundbreaking developments. And I think we've yet to see what they managed to do in a number of other areas, including dementia uh, and, uh, and a number of other things which are on the go there, which I think will produce uh, liver uh, in, and, and so on, which may yet produce other things that uh, uh, will be uh, interesting to see. Thank you. Um, with the increased number of Megapat tech shares in the portfolio in the last few years, how will this affect your ability to outperform your benchmark moving forward? Um, I don't think it affects it adversely. Um, you know, I, I would put it like this, uh, if you if you think about it, you know, that, as I said to you, sort of think about it starting from here. Uh, I realise the tech sector has current problems. Um, and uh, those problems are, you know, coming off the pandemic, where the the, the, the sort of change to digitalization had a very big leap forward and, and brought forward some consumption probably from the future. Um, and I realise that we've obviously had problems with supply chain uh, and China and semiconductors, and we've got um, the impact of uh, uh, of regulatory change uh, or regulatory attitude change on, on the sector. So we've got. You know, a lot of those. Uh, I've got to tell you, I've never yet found it that it didn't have a problem. So I mean, if you if you say, oh, well, I, I, I have had investors who've sat in front of me and, and said, yeah, what about this? What? A, so, you know, like I, I've been in this business for four and a half decades. I can't think of a company I found where you couldn't think of anything that would come up as a problem. There are plenty of problems elsewhere. But starting from where we are, I would say, do you think that, given that these are wage are now rated the same as or worse than our consumer staples, and they are. I mean, uh, do you, because where, where, this is always a relative company, where do you think the relative growth will come? Will it come in the consumer staples that we've got, or do you think it will come in the, relatively in the, um, uh, in the um, tech companies? And your view is pretty good, I'm sure, compared to my view, uh, and you're welcome to it. Um, but don't take my view. Why don't you go and take something like uh, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, because I think he's very good at it, actually, and knows an awful lot about it. They had their results out last night, and I would commend to you, for example, reading his comments. I mean, his view is, yeah, we're going through a difficult period now. We're going to come off, you know, somewhere in the high 30% uh, growth in cloud down to probably next quarter 33. I think it'll probably go lower than that, and people will run around with their hair on fire. But his view, which I subscribe to, is that the percentage of GDP that's generated from tech will continue to grow, that it hasn't reached anywhere near its peak. And so when I think about our portfolio and I think about the three main pillars of our, our investment sectors in our portfolio, which are basically consumer, medical and tech, um, I still like having the consumer, even though obviously it's, uh, it's a bit highly rated at the moment. Um, and uh, we're going through a period where they put up prices and volumes have started to fall. And, in a recession that may come back to bite them a bit um and i like tech even though your know, procedures have not picked up uh, I, I like medical even though procedures have not picked up and still are overhang on our uh, our other stocks um but i'm not going to relinquish the technology sector because of those factors in there i think you know look at it i would say look at it try and invert the thought would you be happy if we had no tech i'm sure that's not what you're suggesting but i, I would be very unhappy with that exposure right thank you um is the overemphasis on ESG messaging a broader issue than just Unilever? Is there a danger that poor strategies with regards to ESG become value destructive? And how do you account for this when looking at a business? Uh, yeah, look, I think there is. Um, I think you know, on the one hand, there's just the amount of effort that goes into this. And you know, none of us has got uh, an infinite capacity and uh, companies are very heavily diverted into it for a start. Um, I looked the other day in uh, in 2010 when we started HSBC, a company that we we would never own, um, had four mentions of uh, of ESG or sustainability in their annual report. Uh, last year they had 47 pages. Right? I, I mean, it's difficult not to think that we're on overkill here, isn't it? Um, then of course we're in box ticking mode. Uh, you know, there's an awful lot of things where people are box ticking. Um, you know, we uh, we don't own any matter in our sustainable portfolio because our 
um, rep risk uh, data when we were buying it said we shouldn't have any. Um, and you know what? I think that's right. Um, but there are plenty of people when the events surrounding what you've been asking me about came to uh, pass with Meta said they were reviewing their Meta holding in their ESG or in their ESG um, uh, mandate. It's like, excuse me, really? <laughs> So there's an awful lot of people who are, have got wonderful data they can give you on you know, uh, women in the workforce and on the board and, uh, and uh, hazardous waste production, et cetera, et cetera. But to actually do anything real with it, I wonder. And then, of course, we've got an awful lot of um, uh, stuff that's going on. And I was on funds, but on companies in the sort of uh, the, the, the greenwashing area. And the greenwashing area is annoying and upsetting to me in itself. But I think it does get used as a cover for bad performance because it's you can't criticize you know we we can't criticize unilever even now when i say things about unilever and i mention purpose there's a tsunami of comments saying what a bad man i am i am because i'm not in favor of esg or sustainability or gay rights or something right this is nonsense you know? and I, I think really when it comes to uh, esg in companies and funds what i think you need is for want of a better word a holistic approach um yeah, you do need to look at the impacts on society and, and attitudes to governance and how they are, are in environmental terms. But, you know, the likelihood that we can tell Pepsi how to do something better about plastic is nil, right? Um, I mean, we can certainly monitor what they're doing plastic, but I doubt whether we can actually have the expertise to tell them. What we can look at, and, and not a lot of people do look at, is how they're working on the non-traditional ESG aspects of their business, which we need to also monitor. Things like R&D spend as a percentage of revenues, you know, things like CapEx uh, in their business. You know, I call me old fashioned. I don't know too many businesses that can grow without uh, committing capital uh, in order to grow their business. Things like returns that they get on margin or CapEx. Well, I think monitoring them is just as important and is completely and utterly omitted by an awful lot of the exponents of of ESG monitoring in companies uh, and in funds, because otherwise you could end up with a wonderfully compliant company that fails you financially, which is what I would suggest you've got in Unilever. Okay, thank you. Um, do you think that the US will continue to provide you with your best source of new ideas? No, no, I don't think it will. Um, I think it's a big economy, not the world's biggest economy. I think it's a a good economy insofar as it continues to show an ability to adjust to uh, circumstances, good or bad, that, uh, that trumps uh, other economies around the world in terms of its flexibility. Um, you know, uh, that's, I think that's marvelous, basically. But no, I mean, if um, we continually review where we might place money if, uh, if the opportunity arises from inflows or realization of something and what we might do. And I've got to say my top three picks at the moment would all be companies um, headquartered in Europe, actually. Um, I mean, I don't think it's because I, uh, you know, if, if I were talking to a bunch of journalists tomorrow, tomorrow's headline was Smith pivots to EU investment. Uh, no, it's just that they're the companies which happen to come off the page of our analysis in terms of their rating, their returns on capital and their free cash flow growth, and which represent, actually we think represent a good fit in terms of the portfolio. That's all. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, back to Intuit. Uh, why didn't you sell Intuit on valuation grounds alone if its shares reach such a significant premium to the likes of Microsoft? You know, I, I thought that there was a reasonable chance that they would actually perform in terms of growth to justify some of that, uh, because we did have a core business here, which was very strong and a core customer set of relationships. And when they started adding things to it, like Credit Karma, it looked pretty good uh, in terms of their additions. But when they got to the I mean, really, it was a single event when they bought MailChimp, we thought MailChimp was a uh, non sort of uh, distinguished business in terms of its competitive position. We thought that it didn't fit with the core business, and we thought that the price was simply off the charts. Okay. Um, do you still adhere to your mantra of only investing in a company even an idiot could run because one day it will be? I'm troubled by it, I've got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked well in the past for us, but it's worked less well in, uh, in recent times, basically. Uh, I mean, look, when we, I don't wish to call anybody, well, there are a few people I'd like to call an idiot, but I'll try not to. Um, when we bought our Microsoft owning, it was still run by Steve Balmer, who was in the midst of, uh, 
of buying the uh, the Nokia handset business and uh, and vaporizing every single euro that he spent on it. Uh, and so you know, and the business survived and, and prospered. Um, uh, but uh, no, I mean, in recent times, I've come to query that quite a bit um, because it simply hasn't worked. I mean, I think our PayPal experience um, has uh, has been a a, um, a a cathartic one, really. It's uh, it's made us feel that in those circumstances, they can do sufficient. I think it depends what the business is. I think a business like Unilever, I'm not saying that anybody is an idiot, particularly I don't want to, but I think a business like Unilever can survive being run by an idiot. You know, I mean, in the end, we're talking about consumer goods. OK, I think when you're there are certain spaces and payment processing would be one that we kind of knew, but we didn't take on board enough. Where I don't think an idiot can run it. I don't think an idiot can run Visa or Mastercard or PayPal. I think it's it's a, a space which has got too much uh, movement going on in, in terms of the, the the new entrants which are entering the space, how you interrelate with them, how you work with the new networks which have been set up by central banks for payment processing and so on. Uh, it's not something where if you you know if you get it wrong, uh, the story I would tell. Um, is a guy we we warm to a great deal, which is Lewis Camilleri, who uh, ran uh, Philip Morris when we first started. And we wrote him a letter about share buybacks, and he invited us to go around and see him in New York when we were in there, which we duly did. And he was a very engaging guy uh, to talk to. Uh, he went on to be the um, chairman of Ferrari after he left uh, Philip Morris. Uh, interesting guy. And he spent three hours talking to us uh, about the business and, and so on. And um, and uh, I think it was Julian said to him towards the end of the meeting, he said, this is really bus easy business to run, I guess. And he said, well, I'm trying not to be insulted by that, but yeah, it is really. <laughs> Julian said, yeah, we gauge that because how else do you manage to calm out three hours to spend talking to us two guys? And it's cut, it's anecdotal. But businesses, you know, like that can be actually run by people who are good and not so good and and still survive and prosper. I'm not sure. We, it's, it depends where you are uh, in it. You know whether you can run a tech business or a payment processing business uh, when you're like that. I, I, I doubt. Whereas you can probably run a medical devices uh, and uh, over-the-counter medicines business without being too good at it. Johnson and Johnson have probably pulled it off, in my view. Yeah. Great. Okay. Coming up to four o'clock, so we'll put this uh, last question in. Um, what were your primary concerns around China that led you to sell Kone? Whilst growth is clearly softened in China in the short term, taking a long term view, their growth would appear uh, attractive relative to Western markets. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, reason, a, a reasonable point on it. But I also think what's going to happen in part is assuming that that comes to pass and I'm, don't, I'm not a crystal ball um, and it might come to pass, but I don't know when. So it may be a lesson. I think one of the things you will find is that Kone is going to be more challenged in terms of the China market by roll of drums, Otis. <laughs> because I think Otis has been relatively absent from there uh, in the, the period of development of China because of its position. You know, when you are a division of a conglomerate like UTC, uh, it, it was self-evident looking at the numbers. Basically, there hadn't been the same kind. When, you, when you're sole business, is elevator and escalators like Kone. Uh, we, we did admire the Kone manager very much that so they made a decision. Look, look, we've got to make a decision on emerging markets and we can't do them all. Should we face east or west? And so they went east. Great decision. Um, wh when you get to be Otis, they weren't really given that decision to even make. They were just told, just send the cash to head office. <laughs> yeah. And we think that they will probably cross. If, if your uh, questioner's uh, prognosis for China is right, I think we'll find that uh, Kone will have a less uh, uh, sort of uh, clear run in China and Otis will have a much better business in China over time. Excellent. OK, thank you very much, Terry. And thank you, everyone, for uh, dialing in and for your questions. Um, as yes, I mentioned please. at the start of the call, uh, we will be um, sending a recording and the slides. Um, and in addition, the fund's long report will be published next month, at which point you'll be able to see the portfolio as at the end of December. So, um, yeah, just to wrap up, thank you very much. Thanks for your continued support. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just like to say, first of all, I'd like to echo comments, say thank you for your continued support and interest. And I know questioners usually say this when they're trying to flatter people so they won't get to, uh, hit over the head with the next question. Good questions.
I thought they're good questions. Well done. Thank you very much. Excellent. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. To all the team at Fundsmith, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Our team of advisors are available if you have any further questions. Further information on the fund discussed can also be found on our website, www.medirect.com.mt. Thanks, everyone.